podcast. So we were living in Japan, right? This is the late 1990s. Some of you kids out there maybe don't even remember that. <laughs> My spouse or significant other and I are living in Japan. She's teaching English. She's on a bit of a heritage quest, being half Japanese. And we lived in this little tiny Japanese apartment in a small town. But as I think about it now, compared to some of what you see in big Japanese cities like your Tokyos, like your Osakas, I think we were living in something akin to a penthouse by comparison. I think they live in like a six foot by six foot box. And that's their whole life. We were not living like that. But by our conventional standards, kind of a small apartment, a kitchen with an adjoining shower and then a bathroom with a toilet, and then three tatami mat rooms with sliding paper doors. Very Japanese. Very, very cool. And we had a cubby there. The only storage space really that existed was this cubby in one of the tatami mat rooms where we had our kotatsu table. That's the tiny table. It's only like, I don't know, a foot or two off the ground. And it's heated, right? There are heating coils. And the idea is you sit on the floor and you put your legs underneath the kotatsu table and it's warm. See, there's no, this was Southern Japan. There's no insulation in the buildings. There's no heater. Most of the year, it's, it's subtropical, so there's palm trees, that kind of thing. Most of the year, it's very, very hot. The most valuable appliance in your house is the air conditioner. Air conditioning is expensive, so what you do is you close off one of your tatami mat rooms that has the air conditioner in it, and then you turn it on, and then you cool off that one little quarter of the apartment, right? And then you take a step outside of that room, and it's instant heat wave. And you just start to sweat. Like, the heat in the summertime was outrageous, man. We're talking 40 degrees here, blankets of humidity. It was intense for a cat like me, especially at the time I had hair all the way down to my butt, not painted by Michelangelo. Refer to last week's episode for that. And so, extremely hot. But there was no heaters, because most of the year... It was too bloody hot. You didn't need one. And there was no insulation really either. Wintertime, though, you get into a little period of time, January, February, late January to maybe late February, where it does get bloody cold, man. And we would have a kerosene stove, Toyo, a Toyo stove, where you had to go down to the local gas station, get yourself some kerosene, fundamentally, bring it home. And you would put it in your little kerosene heater and you would do your best to heat a room, again, one room in your tatami mat apartment. And then the rest of the time you'd sit with your legs underneath the kotatsu table. Very quaint. But the only storage we had really was this cubby. Okay. And the idea was you sleep on a mat. It's like the size of a single bed, smaller than that even in terms of width. And you would sleep on your mat. And then the idea was you roll up your mat. In the morning, you stick it in the cubby, and that is how you maintain order in your Japanese apartment if you are a Japanese person and not a slob Westerner like we are. So some of the time we would roll up our beds and sometimes we would just leave them in our little bedroom. And that was probably a sin. That was probably a crime against Japanese culture. And I do not like to be guilty of that crime. The cubby space was used for storage, okay? And in the storage, there were books. Now, we were there because my wife was hired by the Japanese Exchange and Teaching Program, better known to you and me as the JET Program, which at the time was kind of the preeminent English language teaching program in Japan. There were several different ones, but JET was kind of the creme de la creme. You wanted to get hired by JET if you wanted to come from Australia or the UK or Ireland or Canada or the States. And we had friends from all those places. If you wanted to come and teach in Japan, JET was the program you wanted to work with. It was the government-sponsored program, paid well, they looked after you. And so we got, she got hired by JET and 
there had been, before us, generations of other jet teachers who had done their contracts a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. I think three years was the maximum you could renew. And they had left behind them their trail of stuff, including books, right? So a lot of books were left in our cubby space, and that's great because we needed the entertainment. This was not exactly pre-internet, certainly pre-mobile phone, right? So we were in this little town called Kajiki, and the nearest major center was Kagoshima City, right across the bay from Sakurajima, the active volcano. People had snow brushes in their cars, not because there was snow, but because there was ash from the volcano that they needed to brush off their cars. Very, very different from what we're accustomed to. And once a week, usually on Saturday, we would hop on the train and we would train into Kagoshima City. And there we would go to an internet cafe and we would catch up on our emails and how disappointing it was to arrive after the 25 minute or so train ride into Kagoshima City to walk to where we used to get the internet and find no emails waiting for me. <laughs> Disappointing, man. And then we would go to Maku Donarudo, better known to you and me as McDonald's, or we would go to the KFC. And we couldn't get those things in Kajiki. And why would you want those things? Well, they were a little taste of home, okay? There was an intense culture shock over there. We were a long, long way from freaking Kansas, okay? And so a little touch of home, a little touch of normalcy. You know, I never pined harder for the CBC radio or a Tim Hortons coffee than I did when I was living in Japan. Now, we all know Tim Hortons coffee is not that great, but I certainly missed that cultural connection. You know, I missed that link. I think we may have had somebody send us packaged Tim Hortons coffee at one point. They couldn't package the CBC for us. We couldn't access it via internet. So I missed that kind of Canadiana. And the closest thing we could get was to go to KFC or go to McDonald's for a little treat ski on the weekend and then hop on the train and 30 or so minutes back to Kajiki and back to our little lives. At the time, I had completed my first novel. <laughs> if I can say that without being pretentious, I had completed my first novel not a great novel, probably not even a good novel, but a completed novel, and that in itself is something, okay? Getting to the end, getting to type the end on a novel, on a long piece of work, is an accomplishment all on its own. Even if it's crap, and it probably is, getting to the end is a victory, right? And so we had got to Japan my wife had this full teaching schedule. I was beginning to pick up some tutoring work, but I was occupying myself primarily with trying to write another book. And so I started off down a couple of what turned out to be dead-end roads. It was rather frustrating. I was struggling a bit to get it going. And at the time, I had sent out my little novel to a few places, and the rejections were beginning to come back in. And that's the... It's an important phase of any writer's life. Any writer who aspires to publication, there is a period of time of paying your dues whereby you gather rejections and they hurt. They really freaking hurt, especially the first ones you get because they would seem to confirm for you what you already suspect, which is you're not very good <laughs> and are not good enough and will not be good enough. And so you begin to accumulate these rejections and they weigh on you. But I have learned subsequently that this is a rite of passage. Just like playing to an empty room is a rite of passage. Just like going on tour and having nobody show up is kind of a rite of passage. Or doing it in a van or whatever. It's all these stages of development, right? It's all these stages of experience. So collecting rejections on your not very good first novel is also a rite of passage. And I've come to recognize that since then, but at the time they were weighing on me. And that was informing my attempts to write book number two. And I was struggling very badly to get into a story and to latch onto it and to understand how I write or what I write. And so I would accumulate pages. They were crap pages and I knew it, or they were derivative pages. They were just ripping somebody off. And it was a bit of a struggle, man. 
And I found myself struggling to produce the art. Lack of confidence, too much thinking. It was just a struggle at the time. And so I'm leafing through the books that are in our little cubby space that have been left behind by others who came before us, hired by the JET program, and put up in that little tatami mat apartment in the blue box in Kajiki City, Kajikicho. And I happen upon a book sitting in there, which is Life After God by Douglas Copeland, okay? Now, Copeland was on my radar. A friend of mine, our old friend Deuce, had, I think, read, I don't know if he had actually read Life After God or if he had read Generation X, which was Copeland's first novel and the one that kind of broke him to the world. Generation X, the accidental success. If you pick up an original copy of Generation X, it's kind of an oddly shaped book for a novel. And you will find that the pages are not the same width. It's like this choppy edge to the pages in Generation X. And you think, well, that's intentional, right? That's part of the framing, part of the design of the book. They've done that on purpose. And if I know the story correctly, they didn't do that on purpose at all. The publisher thought so little of the prospects for that novel that they basically cut corners on the production. <laughs> didn't give a crap. He's like, I don't know, use that crappy paper. You know, it doesn't matter if it's cut even or not. Just print this freaking thing because we have to and let's get it out there. And of course it blows up turns into a generational touch point. The term Generation X popularized by that novel. And then I think the naming of subsequent generations has also been popularized by this concept of Generation X. These generations that come after have had their own names to differentiate themselves, etc. I'm not sure how much that was popular culture or in the popular, popular consciousness at the time. But Generation X started that, I think, and became this runaway success with disaffected 30-year-olds like me. And then along came the microsurfs and Girlfriend in a Coma and on and on and on. And on. It's like Douglas Copeland had this enormous literary career, was the hot writer of the 1990s who had his finger on the pulse of technology and culture and the current modern generation. You know, Douglas Copeland was that guy. Probably still is, but he's published a plethora of novels and has shifted more into art and design. I don't think he's published a whole lot recently. So he was on my radar. I just hadn't read him. And so Into My Hands falls Life After God by Douglas Copeland. And I pick it up. And I start to read it, right? And it's really strange to me, and it's a little bit embarrassing to admit this, but I had completed a degree in English literature. I had become qualified to be a high school English teacher. I got the degrees to prove it. And I had no idea, maybe this isn't an indictment of me as much as it is of the programs I was in, but I had no idea that a fella could write this way. And if you read Life After God, it is a first-person narrative. It is very non-linear. It is disjointed. It's described as a book of short stories. It isn't, in my mind. It's a book of events. It's a book of moments. And they are connected. There is a linear story, but it's a little bit, in a certain sense, it's a little bit Tarantino, but it's all over the place. And Douglas Copeland's genius is in his ability to capture moments and profound little things, to capture the beauty in the mundane. He has an extraordinary eye for seeing beautiful things where other people don't. And he's got this ability to recognize what is hip and to talk about it in a profound way. And I just ate this freaking novel up. Life After God, it just touched me. It just hit me in a way that nothing else really ever had. And I didn't realize you could write this way. It's described as the confessional genre. It's one person talking, right? It's a little bit like this, what I'm doing right now, <laughs> just in print form. And so these stories follow this character who's going through a divorce. 
and he's wrestling with the meaning of life and what's it all about. And he's got a kid and he doesn't know what he's doing. And he works this soulless kind of software job. And he's got these friends from high school who are in varying states of falling apart. The lady with the coke habit, you know, the other people who are up to whatever. And then it's just snapshots. It's slice of life from this guy's past, from what's going on currently. And he's on meds for depression. And what's that doing to him? And it is not a linear story. It's just the voice, the really compelling voice of a character speaking. And I love that. I love that. But I'd never really been introduced to that before. I had never, in all of my years of being in academic programs for English literature, never encountered a presentation like that before. And it's like, why? (laughs) At the time, when I was doing my undergrad, Douglas Copeland was very contemporary. So maybe universities, academia didn't appreciate very contemporary. There might be Douglas Copeland courses now, after the fact, looking back at this, especially Copeland as a snapshot of the 90s. You know, the thinking and what was happening with technology and stuff in the 90s. I don't know. I'm not in academia anymore. But at the time, he was contemporary, and maybe that made him persona non grata to the stodgy people who were trying to teach us freaking Moby Dick, which I didn't read. Anyways, I encountered life after God, right? And I had been struggling badly to come up with new work, with where to go from here. The first book that I had written was a complete thrill ride for me. It was just an experiment. It was like, can I even do this? And so I sat down and started writing. And the book is not good. Some of the writing is, but the book is not good, story-wise. That's why it never went anywhere. But it came out of me because I had no expectations on it. I had no parameters on it. It was just this fun thing to try to do, right? And that got rejected. And then I had to absorb that. And then I find myself sitting down to write number two. And all of a sudden, it's not this fun thing anymore. (laughs) I'm a writer now, you know, and I'm aspiring. And I want to get published and yada, yada, yada. All that ego stuff that I have subsequently had to deal with. It's beginning to cripple me, right? It's beginning to cripple me as a writer already having these aspirations and putting these parameters on myself and getting all up in my head about it, right? So long story short, I did manage to produce the draft of a novel when I was in Japan. Eventually, I caught on to something and it was more, I had written kind of a sword and sorcery fantasy kind of thing initially and then drifted into, partly with help from Life After God and some other books that were kicking around, I drifted into something more kind of contemporary. So I was writing a more modern story, and I wrote it, and okay, fine, so I had reached the end twice. Wow, hey, maybe we have something here after all. And it was better. It was not great, but it was better, right? But it was a struggle to get to it. It was a real struggle to get to it, but I had some time and I just picked away at it very slowly. And over the course of that year in Japan, I had the draft of a thing. But in the meantime, I had read Life After God by Copeland and there was something in it that was just so compelling and alluring, something really important to me. And when I got back home, we came back, we moved to L-Town eventually, and I just could not restrain this book that was in me, okay? And I just sat down and started writing, and I started writing in this kind of non-linear confessional style that I had never done before. And this thing, this piece of work, just burst out of me. And in the course of, I don't know how long it was, not very long, a draft of this short novel, slightly more than a novella, just burst out of me from the inspiration of life after God. And I couldn't restrain it. It was just this magical moment of this thing, this piece of work wanting to come through me. I talked about this last week with respect to Michelangelo and what Ram Dass said about a person's art that comes through them, having this veneer of divinity on it, being the expression of the divine in the world. And I've had the experience of that happening. Okay. When I wrote what turned out to be the third book, 
it burst out of me in a way that nothing ever had before. And there was something happening with me. And I was a conduit in that moment for this piece of work. And it was by far better than the other things that I had written. Still not there. All right, I sent it out to a lot of places, a lot of editors, a lot of agents, a lot of publishers, and I sent that thing around because I believed in it because I felt a certain amount of divinity in it. And it was rejected by everybody who bothered to write back. <laughs> Part of that rite of passage, right? Part of that paying your dues. I did receive one. This is what I cherish probably above anything else in terms of my past literary endeavors. I received one, not handwritten, but one personal response from a publisher on the West Coast. And that personal response, you don't get that. Okay, you don't get that from kids. I said very seriously, those who bothered to respond, most of the time, you send out your stuff to an agent, to a publisher, you hear nothing. All right, the slush pile, the quote unquote slush pile, which is just this unsolicited pile of manuscripts, there's hundreds of them. And they'll have assistants maybe begin to thumb through them or whatever. These people are way too busy for the slush pile. It's extremely rare for a slush pile author to get discovered and published, right? Extremely, extremely rare. They do not have time. And they certainly, if they respond at all, don't have time for a personal response, right? They respond with a form letter. Thank you, not right for our publication at this time. Please feel free to submit future work. Best of luck in your future endeavors. Stamped signature, right? <laughs> I got a bunch of those. But I got a personal written response from an editor on the West Coast that said, there's potential in this work. It's not right for us. There's a few things that don't quite work here. But, you know, the point was he saw enough in the work to take a few minutes and actually respond personally. And I hold on to that letter. I still have it. I still have all the rejections, I think. I think, I don't know if in the purge last summer I threw that stuff away or not. Maybe I did. But I held on to that. It was the one piece, it was the one thing that the literary industry gave me back, which was just a personalized letter from an editor that said, you probably have something, it's not there yet. Okay, great. That's an aside. The point is this thing burst out of me, right? And this conduit thing, this divinity thing is important, right? It's important in a couple of contexts because I've struggled really badly lately with content for this podcast. I've struggled very badly for this week's episode. There has been a ton of struggle, right? And we have this ethos, right? We have this myth about the struggling, starving artist, right? They make really compelling movies about these people who struggle and sacrifice and suffer so hard for their art or whatever it is they're working on. And this is the myth that we've adopted culturally, that this is supposed to be hard. And if it's easy, then something is wrong. And I'm here to try to burst the bubble on that for you, okay? And I've had a conversation recently with somebody important to me who talked about life having come too easily, <laughs> feeling a certain amount of guilt because things have just happened too easily in life. And when you drill a little bit deeper down into that life experience, you find it hasn't been all that easy at all, but we do have a tendency to minimize our own struggles in a way. You know, some bad stuff happens to us. We try to kind of shrug that off. And I don't know why we do that. It's like this stiff upper lip thing, or we don't want to be self-indulgent, or it's in some way selfish to actually feel your own freaking pain. It causes a lot of problems, man. But there was this idea that life had come too easily. And I adapt that to this process of art, where we have this myth that says, Art is supposed to come with great difficulty and great struggle. And we have this movies where this neurotic writer is bent over the page and then crinkling up the paper and throwing it in a basket and, you know, wiping everything off his or her desk with their arm and smashing their heads and going and get drunk and falling over and picking a fight at the local bar because the writing is not coming. Or the songwriter who's blocked 
or the painter who just can't find it. And we glorify this struggle, right? In a way that we that teaches us that this is how it's supposed to be. And I'm here to say it's not supposed to be that way, kids. It is not supposed to be that way. The work that comes through you quickly and easily and with flow, that is the divine work. How many times have you heard it said, be hearing an interview with a songwriter, let's say, and they just will have released this massive song or some classic rock artist who had a hit song back in the late 1970s. And they'll say, oh yeah, we wrote that one in like 15 minutes, just came out of us, man. And everybody's jaw hits the freaking floor. Like what? Like, how did that happen? Well, how did that happen is flow. How did that happen is divinity, that divine spark. The art is not supposed to be difficult to produce. It's supposed to come through you. It's supposed to pick up your flavors. It's supposed to have your talent on it. But the struggle, if you're really fighting hard and struggling, then you're probably not producing the art that you're supposed to produce, or at least not today. (laughs) It's not supposed to be this awful struggle. Now, I know it is, and I know it can be, and I know resistance happens, and I know blocks happen, but those things are you choking out the conduit or life choking out the conduit. When you tap into your real artistic expression, when you tap into your real music, your real writing, your real painting, your real sculpture, or your real building the fence in the backyard, whatever it is, when it comes through you and it's easy, that's when it's right. That's when it's right and natural, okay? And we have this glorification of this awful struggle and then the plucky triumph at the end where the character has this epiphany or changes something in his or her life and it all just blossoms into place. And okay, that does happen, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's Hollywood, man. That's freaking Rocky, okay? And that script, by the way, was written in a matter of a couple of weeks. (laughs) You know, Stallone wrote that very, very quickly, the plucky underdog story. So we have adopted and absorbed this myth where if the art comes easily, it's not good, right? If the art comes easily, it doesn't have value because we didn't have to struggle for it. But you're not supposed to struggle for it. You're supposed to be the conduit for it. And then we have this other absurd myth that if it does come through you, if it does come easily, we have this guilt attached to it. We feel guilty if we're not struggling like other people struggle or struggling like we're supposed to struggle, right? Ah, I feel really guilty because it's all coming so easily to me right now. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. But the point is it's supposed to come easily. It won't always. It won't always because we're human and our thinking brains and our egos and all that stuff get in the way. And so what I say to you is, if you're enjoying a period right now where things are flowing and things seem to be going easily for you, yay! (laughs) Celebrate that. Be grateful for that. Be freaking happy, right? Because there will be times of struggle. Right? There will be times when things aren't so freaking great. But if you're having this period of time right now where things are just flowing for you and things are falling into your lap and things are dropping into place, be freaking grateful and tell yourself that it's because you are in the right frame of mind, you are in the right energy, you are in the right vibration for these things to work for you. Pure thoughts and clean living. Kids, there was a guy when I was working at the grocery store. He used to be the delivery man for, I don't know, a bread company or something like that. Older guy. And he always had a freaking smile on his face, man. Always had a jaunty little pip in his stride. And he'd say, how you doing, man? Pure thoughts and clean living. You know, pure thoughts and clean living. He's living right, man. It's all working for him. <laughs> This interesting perspective. I don't know what was going on in his freaking life, but he was happy. You know, he wasn't getting all down and getting all guilty about, man, things are going too freaking well. If things are going well for you, 
artistically, if things are going well for you in life, freaking celebrate it, man. Freaking be grateful and freaking take advantage. Use that flow to create. You know, use that flow to make the world better, to make yourself better and be grateful for it. You know, there's no reason to feel guilty for things going well for you based on this Hollywood myth that life and art and business and everything has to be a freaking struggle all the time. Flow is the opposite of struggle. The good stuff comes through flow. So do not seek out that kind of struggle. That is not how it's supposed to work, man. It's not how it's supposed to work. So don't feel guilty if things are coming and working for you right now. On the other side of that is you can have things going really, really well for you. And then there's certain parts of it that just don't sit well. You know, you can have the state of flow and be producing, or you can have the state of flow and life is falling into place, but you can still have stuff that doesn't quite work for you. You can still have stuff that bothers you, that you're not happy with, right? And then you can layer guilt upon that too. It's like, everything's great, really. And here I am complaining to myself that X, Y, and Z (laughs) are not 100% perfect. And how dare I? You know, and then you begin to pile on yourself again. It's this weird sense of guilt that we attach to so many freaking things as a culture. And again, that is not freaking helpful. You know, you are allowed to have things going well and still feel as though There are things that are missing, you know, things that aren't quite how you want them to be. Why shouldn't life be as perfect as you can make it? Why shouldn't you be as happy as you can be? You know, you came to this space. You came to this planet, to this reality with a set of goals in mind. You know, you came to this space to be and achieve something. And you can be rolling along and things going really, really well, but still feel as though there are pieces missing. And those pieces are missing because they are things that you desire. And they came here, you came here with those desires in mind. So don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty if things are going well and there's stuff that you feel still isn't quite right. You know, that's all part of the evolution. This is all part of you becoming the person and living the life that you intended to come here and live. You know, if there are things that you want that you don't have, there's a reason why you want those things. You know, they point to something in your heart, something in your soul, in your spirit that wants to be fulfilled. And it's when you are fulfilling all of those things that you become the best version of you. And the best version of you is the one that's most capable of adding or contributing to the world. (laughs) So don't feel bad about having desires, right? Don't feel bad about having things that you wish could be a little bit better. You know, there's no shame in that. This is a process of you evolving to your highest self. And sometimes having those desires is learning to not need those desires, right? Learning to not need those things or differentiating between What's a genuine desire and what's an ego desire? I mean, all these things point to bigger questions, right? But they're all wrapped up in you being a better you. You realize you want this certain level of income or this certain relationship. And then you begin to realize, well, do I really want that or does my ego really want that? You know, does my ego want that level of income or does my ego want that kind of relationship? because it looks good to other people, or it's what my parents wanted for me, or something like that. Is it that? And does it point to an ego thing? And if it does, then you can begin to strip away that ego, right? And you can just be okay with how things are. You know, you can, as the Tao says, have faith in the way things are. But if it's a real soul desire, if it's something you came here for, then fulfilling that is part of your destiny. It's part of making you the best you and having this experience in this reality that you wanted to have. I think we have way too much guilt about stuff that we shouldn't have guilt about. It's okay for things to be going well for you. It's okay for your art to be coming out of you. It's supposed to. 
That's why you are the conduit for it. Don't feel guilty about things going well. And don't feel guilty about wanting something more or something different even when they are. I don't know why we have this guilt. Empathy is one thing. I mean, it's very possible to look around and say, man, I've got it good, and those people don't. And it's okay to recognize that, right? And to have empathy for that. And what can we do about that? You know, how can I use this place of being okay to help in some way people for whom it's not? I mean, it's not hard to look around and see where things are a freaking gong show. Look at Gaza. Look at Ukraine, right? And if you are a human being of any character at all, you look at all of that and you say, this is awful. What are we doing? Why are people this way to themselves? And then you can latch onto that guilt because it's not you. (laughs) And that can kill you and that can kill your spirit and that can kill the potential you have to make a difference in the world. It really can The difference is made by people who are living their best divine life and experience. I know that's high-level stuff. I know that makes me sound freaking nuts. But really, you know, I'm hearing these stories and I'm feeling in my own self these stories of just the guilt we attach to things. And the guilt is not helpful. Empathy is helpful. Sympathy is helpful. Guilt is not helpful. So if you're out there right now and you're experiencing this guilt because things are going well and that doesn't seem fair, stop that. Think of how you can turn that into some contribution to the world. And if you're out there feeling guilt because things are going well and you still want more or you still want different, stop it. All right. Those desires point you in the direction you should go. If things are going great, and you still feel an absence, or you still feel something missing, inquire into what that is, and what does it mean, and what does it say, and what is life asking of you, as we've talked about before. You know, all of this, as Ramda said, is grist for the mill. All of this is grist for awakening. All of this is grist for knowing yourself. And you can have gratitude. You can have gratitude. If things are going great for you, freaking fabulous. Be so grateful for that. (laughs) Be so grateful for that. But don't buy into this notion that everything has to be a freaking struggle. Because once you begin to think those thoughts, if you hold that belief, guess what you get in life? You get a freaking struggle, man, because everything responds to the vibration. You know, everything responds to your beliefs or you will see struggle where there isn't struggle because that's what you're conditioned in your own mind to believe, right? What happened to me? I was a conduit for this work, and I produced that book, and it is what it is. And then I went and I was working full-time in places, and my writing kind of fell apart because I didn't have the mental energy or the time to devote to it. Then some years later, I went freelance, and the idea was I'm going to freelance for a living. It's going to free up my time, and I'm going to do some more writing again. And then I took that piece of work that I had produced in Japan and I rewrote it, and that turned into the fourth book, which is also not great. But the writing itself kept improving, kept improving, kept improving. But then my head just came so much into it, and it stopped coming easily after that. And then I began to mimic other people, and then I just fell apart. I just fell apart as a creative writer because I didn't allow the conduit anymore. And I don't know if I bought into this idea of the struggling, starving writer or not. Maybe I did. I didn't certainly didn't glorify it, but I began to embody it. And I think once you begin to embody things like that, it's very easy to go off the rails. But you know, sometimes, as I've said before, if it's not coming through you, one of two things, either you've blocked the conduit or it's not what you're supposed to do. It's not what's supposed to come through you, right? So I began to try to force this writing, writing from my head, not allowing it to come through me, getting frustrated. And maybe the truth is I was done, right? Maybe there was a phase of my creative life that was setting up what I'm doing now or what I might do in the future. I don't know. Point is I became frustrated and there's a myth that says you're supposed to. (laughs) But the best work I ever did is the work 
that came out fast and clean and easy, man. And there's no guilt in that. That's how it's supposed to be. That's the point. Man, if things are going well and coming easily to you, that's how it's supposed to be. That means you're doing it right. It doesn't mean you won't struggle in the future. It doesn't mean bad things won't happen to you. Life is life. Humanity is humanity. The world is the world. So if things are going well, artistically, if things are going well in life, clip off the guilt, man. Enjoy it. Be grateful for it. Use it to full effect for your potential and for your impact on the world. And if you're doing well and you want more or you want different, inquire into that, right? That is so healthy. This is pointing you. You have reached a point where you can begin to dig even deeper into what makes you fulfilled and happy. That means you've covered off some needs. <laughs> that means you've reached this point where you can be really indulgent with what you want because those more basic needs have been met. Wow, how many people get there? Fabulous, life is working for you. So inquire into what it is you think is missing. You know, inquire into, is that an ego thing or is that like a soul thing? And don't be distrustful of what comes easy, man. Do not be distrustful of what comes easily. Don't feel like this thing you made can't be any good because you didn't have to struggle with it. You're not supposed to struggle with it. It's supposed to come through you. It's supposed to come easily. That doesn't mean you don't do your diligence. It doesn't mean you don't do the work. But it's not supposed to be a struggle. If it's a huge struggle, you're either doing the wrong thing or you're way in your head about it and you are not letting the divinity flow, okay? That's all I'm saying. Stop feeling guilty about stuff you shouldn't feel guilty about. I'm saying it to me too, okay? Feel guilty about the stuff you should feel guilty about and fix it if you can, but don't add layers of guilt into a world that is saturated by it, okay? That's as far as I'm going on this episode, because I'm recording it very late, and I gotta edit it and get it out. I don't even have a music recommendation this week. I poured over a bunch of new songs, and some of them I liked, some of them are good, but just not stuff that really grabbed me by the face. Stuff I talk about on here, I want to really grab me by the face. So I'm not making a music recommendation this week. That gives you an opportunity to go to the John Huff podcast referenced on the podcast 2024 playlist on Spotify and listen to all the great stuff that's already been posted there this year. I'll do an abbreviated Patreon plug. I know this has been a bit of a strange episode, but in a sense, I'm winging this one. <laughs> it was a real struggle to come up with content. For a, with a topic for this one, you know? Not supposed to be a struggle. So I had to reckon with that. There's a Patreon page, however, for the podcast, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. $5 a month, one tier of membership. Signing up for that is saying to me that you enjoy what I'm doing. You're getting something from it. You're getting edification, education, inspiration, motivation, whatever it is you're getting from this. If it's worth a buck twenty-five for every episode that I do. Please consider signing up on Patreon. I've merch at john huffcom I think that's what it is. Yes, slash shop. T-shirts, mugs. I'll just ask you to share these episodes if they work for you, man. Or ladies, whatever. However you identify. If this is working for you, and you know people who might benefit from just a little jolt of inspiration, a friendly voice in their ear holes, please consider sharing these episodes. I want to thank each and every one of you for the support this far. I hope this episode doesn't disappoint you. I know it's hard to follow God's naked ass. <laughs> Even Michelangelo had trouble following up that painting on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. Okay, very, very tough to mess with perfection. Very, very tough to produce new work after that, right? But pretty sure he didn't start feeling guilty about wanting to do more work after. Okay, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you ever so kindly for all of your support. Going to shut up shutting up, except to say good things happen when you put yourself out there, kids, and when you let it come through you. I know it's hard to do. Try not to choke that off with guilt. I will be back next week with something. In the meantime, enjoy yourselves. Have a good time. And hey, kids, I'll check you later. Yeah. And that is what they call flying by the seat of your pants. <laughs>